Good morning, viewer. Corey here. Right now it is 6.20 in the morning, and it is Wednesday the 7th. We are... <clears throat> we didn't really get much sleep last night. We, um... We haven't really been able to get much sleep in the last few... It's been about a week and a half now. My sleeping... My schedule's just been super weird. And, um... So I just decided... Why not just read more? <laughs> my body is drained. We're going to go over the preface to the second edition. No, let's go ahead and, and, and read this part. So it says, preface to the second edition. It has now been 25 years since I first discovered the word chakra. At that time, I rarely found the word in, in, in an index or card catalog. Yet there are now countless references and scores of New Age books on the subject, not to mention turning forks, colored candles, incenses, T-shirts, and the usual paraphernalia that embellish any archetypal theme awakening to the collective consciousness. While I am, while I am duly flattered by those who credit the first edition of this book as seminal on that trend, I believe it is inst instead part of a larger cultural thirst for models of integration and wholeness. In short, the chakra system as an idea is an idea whose time has come. As we begin the third millennium of the current era, we are facing the time unparalleled in human development. Our history books have shown us that the systems we use to organize our lives have an enormous effect on our collective reality. This knowledge makes an imperative to innovate systems that serve us intelligently. As we pass through this particular cusp in history, we must build bridges between past and future, not only creating models that fit new realities, but continually updating old models to keep them viable in a rapidly changing culture. If the chakra system is going to be meaningful in the 21st century, it must reflect the underlying fabric that has always existed, while still having the flexibility to be relevant to the demands of modern life. The ancients created a profound system. We can now marry its wisdom with modern information about the natural world, the body, and the psyche to create an even more effective system. When I first, inj when I first injected chakra theory as such ideas as groundbreaking, or proposed the idea of a downward current of consciousness, some were skeptical. Most interpretations of the chakras focus on transcending our physical reality, portraying it as inferior or degenerate. Life is suffering, we are told, and the transcendent planes are its antidote. If life is suffering and transcendence the antidote, the logic of this equation implies that transcendence is counter to life itself, a view that I seriously question in this book. I do not believe that we need to sacrifice the zest, our zest for life and its enjoyment, in order to advance spiritually, nor do I see spirituality as anti antithetical to worldly existence, or that spiritual growth requires intense domination and control of our innate biological natures, hence of life itself. I believe this is a part of a, pro a control paradigm, appropriate, for the f appropriate to a former age, but inappropriate to the current challenges of our time. These challenges require models of integration rather than domination. Since the early 80s, when I first wrote this book, the collective paradigm has shifted considerably. Emphasis on reclaiming the body and acknowledging the sacredness of Earth has increased exponentially, along with a recognition that matter has an innate spiritual value. Because matter is simply the spirit's way of differentiating itself in form. Because God is the spirit of all things and is individualized through the material of things, like me and you, like we're we're the same thing. You know, behind the mask we wear, you and I are one. Remember, there's there's the there's only one monism, one spirit, one mind. You know, one soul of the universe, which 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 brings itself down and manifests itself through everything that lives in existence. 
We have learned that repression of natural forces creates unpleasant side effects and shadow energies. Ignoring the body creates illness. Devaluing the earth creates eco ecological crisis. Rep repressed sexuality can explode in rape and incest. It is now time to reclaim that we have lost and integrate that we have lost and integrate with new frontiers. It becomes both a personal and a cultural imperative to review, to reweave the disparate concepts of East and West, spirit and matter, mind and body. As Marion Woodman said, quote, matter without spirit is a corpse, and spirit without matter is a ghost, end quote. Both describe something that is dead. The tantric philosophies from which the chakras emerge are a philosophy of weaving. Their, their many threads weave a tapestry of reality that is both complex and elegant. Tantra is a philosophy that is both pro-life and pro-spiritual. It is both, both, you know, it's for both nature and it's for both spirit, you know, your body and your mind. And like we were saying before, the body is just as important, you know, the mind may be more important, but we can't forget this, this temple that we live in. You know, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God? We need to take care of this, this, this body, because it is our vehicle of traveling in the material plane. The tantric philosophies from which the chakras emerge are a philosophy of weaving, their many threads weave a tapestry of reality that is both complex and elegant. Tantra is a philosophy that is both pro-life and pro-spiritual. It weaves spirit and matter back into its original whole, yet continues to move that whole along its spiral of evolution. It is at this time that we finally have the privilege to weave the knowledge of ancient and modern civilization into an elegant map for the evolutionary journey of consciousness, this book represents a map to that journey. Consider it the user's guide to the chakras. I suspect there will be many more editions, but many more authors in the future. By many more authors in the future. But this is the current update from my perspective. So what's different in this edition? It contains more references to the tantric teachings, as I have had more time to study them. Though I still... Though I have still tried to keep my words as Western and non-esoteric as possible, I have also revised and shortened it a bit, as so many have told me they felt intimidated by the size of the previous version. Eliminated, eliminated was the ongoing political rhetoric so important to me in my 20s. Now in my mid-40s, though my spiritual politics still hold, I prefer to let a system speak for itself. Some of the science has also been updated, as even our models for matter are rapidly changing. I have tried to retain my original metaphysical flavor in this book, and keep it distinct from my subsequent books, The Sevenfold Journey, Reclaiming Mind, Body, and Spirit Through the Chakras, written with Selena Vega, 1993, oh, one year before I was born, is the workbook that contains the, quote, practice, end quote, to this book's, quote, theory, end quote. It features the daily exercises, both mental and physical, that support personal progress through the chakra system. My third book, Eastern Body, Western Mind, Psychology and the Chakra System, is a path to the self, is a look at the psychology of the chakras, their development progression, the traumas and abuses that happen to us at each chakra level, and how to heal them. It weaves Western psychology and somatic therapies into the Eastern system of the chakras. The book you now hold describes the underlying metaphysical theory behind the chakra system, more than just an assemblage of energy centers located in the body, which would be the seven major nerve ganglia, as we had mentioned before, that we, were, we want to remember from what we had gotten from you. The chakras reveal a profound mapping of the universal principles, intricately nested within each other and progressively transcendent planes of reality. The levels of consciousness that the chakras represent are doorways into these various planes. As these planes are embedded within each other, none can be eliminated from the system and still have it hold, and still have it hold together theoretically or ex experientially. 
have it hold together, or would it should it be held together? Anyway, I do not believe that we would be given a system of seven chakras to merely discard the lower three, because the lower three is what grounds us to the physical being. Remember how we were saying tantric, this tantric theory, theology that she's talking about is pro pro life and pro spirit. You know, it's for both matter and for both the spirit. Because matter is the 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 other half of all of life, you know, it's the second half of life, you know, it's just as important as the spiritual part of our life. This book looks at both outer and inner realities. It looks at the chakra system as a profound system for spiritual growth, as well as a diagram of the sacred architecture in which we are embedded, the larger structure that holds us if we are indeed, quote, fashioned in the image of God, end quote. I believe the sacred architecture found in nature is the blueprint for internal structures as well, both in the body and in the psyche. When we bridge the, when the bridge is made between our inner and outer worlds, they become seamlessly one. The inner growth is no longer antithetical to outer work in the world. Therefore, this book uses many models that are scientific in nature as a way of illustrating ancient wisdom with modern metaphors. Tantric scholars and kundalini gurus often draw a distinction between the chakras as witnessed through kundalini experiences and the westernized model of the chakras as a, quote, personal growth system, end quote. Some claim that this distinction is so great that there is no, that there is no meaningful relationship between the two, using either one to deny the validity of the other. There is without a doubt a marked difference. For example, between having an insight or vision Six chakra association. Remember the sixth chakra, Ajna, which is our third eye, our mind's eye. Okay, remember what insight is. Insight is a faculty of our mind, which allows us to see, you know, in the future of things. You know, if I do this, this is what's going to out be the outcome of it. You know, that's insight. Being able to see the results of a certain action from a distance. You know, and that's the exact same opposite of, remember, we also learned about farsightedness, okay? Farsighted is the exact opposite, you know, this, this is what I need to stay away from, you know, in order for me to stay, you know, working in this direction that I want to keep going. Yeah, we haven't been up for too long, so I'm, um drinking my water, remember two cups of water right when you wake up, remember we're made mostly of water, and it's uh, the water that we need to drink which starts the internal organs of our body, okay, I would rather prefer you to drink two cups of water in the morning than to eat something, you know, because the body is what's going to actually start your system, okay, and then find, you know, the food to eat after you've already, you know, drank your water and got your, your body started. And experiencing the overwhelming inner luminescence associated with a kundalini awakening. Kundalini is another name for energy. Yet I do not see these experiences as unrelated but existing on a continuum. I firmly believe the clearing, that clearing the chakras through understanding their nature, practicing related exercises, and using visualization and meditation prepares the way for spiritual opening that is apt to be, to be less tumultuous then it is so often the case for kundalini awakenings. And one thing I really want to say about this, we're going to be using, we're going to be practicing visualization and meditation for ourselves as well. Remember what we've been learning about the power of visualizations and meditations, you know, through everything we've learned about all the other books that we've read in The Power of Our Mind. You know, when we visualize it and we actually see ourselves as that and emotionalize that, that image that we have, and actually connect with that, you know, that thing that we see ourselves as. You know, this is what's going to allow us to move in that direction of something. Remember, we're, we're dealing with the mind. We're dealing with our own mind. You know, we have to impress it upon our own subconscious, you know, our, our, our deeper, un, unconditioned mind. Because this thing is what's conditioning it to be a certain way. Remember how we were talking about the only activity which we possess as spirits or the power to think. 
you know, on his spirit, we are, we simply are, we're something that's unconditional. And once we begin to think, you know, it's when we begin to condition ourselves in certain ways. You know, likewise with visualization, you know, it's a form of thinking. You know, a quote by Aristotle, he says, the soul cannot think without forming a mental picture. You know, every thoughts we think invariably have a picture associated with it. And that's what visualization is. You know, you, you have that mental picture in your mind, you know, and, and once that picture, you are continuously thinking about that, and that picture gets impressed upon you, you move in that direction. You know, the, the eternal creative energies within you just just naturally move you in that direction. I believe this westernization is an important step for speaking to the western mind in a way that is harmonious with the circumstances in which we live rather than antithetical to it. It gives us a context in which these experiences can occur. Likewise, there are many who say that the chakras as vortices in the subtle body, remember the subtle body is our mind body, okay, and these vortices, these circles, okay, because chakras is another name for a wheel, or chakra is another name for a wheel. Remember how we were saying these wheels of life, you know, both receive and give energy in spiral form. Having nothing whatsoever to do with the physical body or the central nerve ganglia emanating from the spinal column, and that a spiritual awakening is not a somatic experience, because an experience is not entirely somatic, does not mean that it, its somatic aspect is negated. Hold on, I want to look up what that word somatic means. Hey, it's already 636. You know, it's crazy, like... You know, we're learning about our mind and stuff, you know, it's it's one thing that's amazing, it's when your mind gets so engaged in doing something, you know, the the reality of time, you know, seems to just disappear. You know, your your mind is so absorbed in what it's doing, you know, it doesn't realize like time doesn't even exist. So matic. Thank you. My dictionary just told me I'm smart. So somatic, of the body, bodily, or physical. Anatomy, zoology, pertaining to the body wall of an animal. Or cell biology, pertaining to or affecting the somatic cells, as distinguished from the germ cells. So somatic, it's a type of, of cellular structure within your, your body, and it's responsible for certain sensations that you receive from the outer world. From what it sounds like, anyone who has witnessed or experienced the physical sensations and spontaneous movements known as kriyas that are typical of the kundalini awakening cannot, de cannot deny that there is a somatic com component. I believe this view is just more evidence of the divorce between spirit and body that I find to be a primary illusion from which we must awaken. A man from India came to one of my workshops and told me that he had to come all the way to America to learn about chakras because it was so er esoteric in India that it was, quote, sacred knowledge, end quote, barred from anyone with a family and a job. I see, quote, grounding, end quote, the chakras as allowing the material to be more accessible to more people. While Eastern gurus might warn that this is dangerous, I have, I have found through my 25 years work of working with the system that this common sense approach enables many to transform their lives without the dangerous and ungrounded symptoms so often associated with Kundalini. Far from diluting the spiritual base from each of the chakras are rooted, this approach enlarges it. Take your time reading this book. There is much to ponder. Let the chakras become a lens through which you can look at your life and world. The journey is rich and colorful. Let the rainbow bridge let the rainbow bridge of the soul unfold before you as you walk your path. And that it was written in December nineteen ninety eight. Now that is a preface to the second edition. Now we're gonna go over the preface to the first edition. So I'll see you.